What up, Wizards? It's the Dizzard. No one's ever actually called me that. I'm from SPMTG. We like it a magic. And ever since the beginning of this season, I have been digging and digging every day, and I feel like my shovel has finally hit something. So today I'm going to show you my best build of what I think is seriously going to be one of the best decks in the format after rotation. Let's take a look at Rakdos Treasure. And we're back to finally talk about a deck that I'm super excited to do. I'm stoked to do this deck tech because we've been over all of the other themes and mechanics and stuff from AFR. We started with Dragons, solid deck. If you haven't seen the tech yet, check it out. It's a good one. Same thing with Orzhov Dungeons. It's a fine deck and all that, but I was really waiting to get to the treasure theme because I think of all the things you can do in Adventures of the Forgotten Realms, treasure is uh, by far the most competitively broken. Like, Wizards printed a bunch of cards that do a thing. Like, they already do a fine thing, but they also just poop out Lotus Petals. And, like, who would have known that that would, be, <laughs> that would be kind of ridiculously good? Like, this is a nutso banana bread deck with nuclear trousers, and I can't wait to show it to you. But before we get into it, as usual, sorry about this part, but if you do the YouTube stuff, it would mean a lot to me. Like, subscribe, hit the bell for the notifications if you want me in your feed more often. That sounds like a good deal. Or do any of this stuff down here. As far as the Twitch stream stuff goes, a couple of things I'm excited about. we got a birthday stream coming up this month because my birthday is in August. And we also have the 12-month anniversary, the one-year anniversary of the Twitch stream. So stop by if you get the chance. We have a lot of fun over there. And here is Ziggy. But I probably should go ahead and tell you what's in this deck. We've been here long enough. And by the way, Ziggy's still down here. He's just on my knee. He's, if he, <laughs> he didn't disappear, don't worry. If, we're going to be going to some like title cards here to show you what's in the deck soon. But for your own comfort, don't worry. Ziggy's going to be down here the whole time. Just so you know that. <laughs> anyway, we got to do the main deck, the sideboard, the lands, the power rankings, the example game, the final thought. Like I'm Jerry Springer. we got a lot to get to. So let me go ahead and tell you what's in the deck, starting with all the treasure makers. Because I've already said this, but it bears repeating, I think. There are 20-plus things that make treasure in this deck. So you're going to be swimming in a veritable Scrooge McDuck vault of coins? Is that <laughs> whatever treasure gives you <laughs> by the time you're done here? But we're going to start with the four copies of Kalein Reclusive Painter and the three copies of Magda Brazen Outlaw. I don't know why she's a reclusive painter. I seem to see her every time I boot up Arena, Waka Waka. This thing's in a lot of decks right now because a lot of people have recognized the power of the rate here. I mean, two mana for three really distinct things, right? You get a one-two body that also leaves behind a treasure, a lotus petal. I'm going to keep calling it that. <laughs> like That's what it is. <laughs> You put it into that context, it just seems really powerful, because it is really powerful, but this also gives you, you know, five, five, or six, six gold span dragons later on in the game, or even bigger some of the time, which is nuts in and of its own right, but you can even just make Magda like a 3-2, and you'd be surprised how important that is some of the time. Just a really flexible card, and we don't have to worry too much about the legend rule with her either, because we can just play another Kalein, submit that one to the legend rule, and we get a treasure out of it. We didn't get nothing out of that deal. We at least got a treasure to set ourselves up for a later turn. Or we can use a treasure while the Kalein's on the table to play a second Kalein. The second Kalein will be beefier than the first, and sometimes that'll matter too. So a lot of reasons not to care about the legend rule with Kalein, but with Magda, we care a little bit more. This is actually only really good on attacks. There's no, like, Jaspera Sentinel in this deck to tap Magda without her having to attack. So it's powered down from some other iterations of decks that Magda's been in in the past, but it's still a pretty good card. Nice little two-drop. It'll sometimes trade, sometimes get in for some extra damage and create treasures. There's just no reason, I think, not to play Magda, but it's actually not as important as cards like Kalainar that give you a treasure token the turn they enter. That said, Magda can lead to multiple treasure tokens. That's a good place to be, and sometimes if you have enough treasures out, you don't even have to be attacking with Magda. You can just sack some treasures, go grab a gold span or something, and get to attacking with that. But the two cards that exceeded my expectations the most in terms of like treasure making cards, easily if by a mile, <laughs> we're shambling gas and deadly dispute, especially when combined. Now, if you haven't been up on the format in a while, you might be surprised to hear this, but both of these cards are two of the biggest, like, standout sort of sleepers from AFR so far in both normal standard and 2022 standard, whether you want it regular or rotation proof. This is a potent combination of cards that work really well just on their own, right? Deadly Dispute is a slightly more expensive village rights, but it always pays you back that extra mana and the treasure tokens. Shambling Ghast, yeah, it can take out a small creature sometimes, 
which does matter some of the time. But what you mostly want to be doing this with this is blocking in the early game, even if you don't kill the creature that you're blocking, and just leaving behind a treasure on like turn two, three, four to ramp you in this hellacious way. Like just that extra mana can mean such a huge deal to this deck. But again, these cards are best when combined. You play Shambling Gast on turn one, turn two you play a Deadly Dispute, say end of your opponent's turn or on blocks or something, and you'll leave behind two treasure tokens. So when you play your land on the next turn, on turn three, you'll have five mana available to you. So you can do like turn three gold span dragon pretty easily in this deck if you have these two cards in your opening hand. It's just an unbelievable combination of cards, guys. I'm telling you, try it out. Many a deck have already experimented with this combination of cards and it's carrying a couple of decks pretty far at this point. So if you haven't experienced the power of gas plus dispute yet, give it a shot. It is impressive. Now, I also run in two copies of Skullport Merchant in the deck, and I don't think this is important enough to run four copies of. I really don't. I think it's good in some decks. You know, that Black White Kaya deck that runs Blood on the Snow, and it can put Ghost Form counters on this guy. I really like it there, but in terms of this deck, I don't. it's not as good, but it's still a four toughness, three drop. That's not bad. That creates a treasure, which is really, really good. We can go from Merchant into Goldspan Dragon on the next turn really easily. Like that play. And if we do get hit by a Sweeper, if we're going to lose a creature in combat, whatever. If we just need to draw cards and we got a bunch of treasures laying around. This dude is there to make sure that we can draw some cards. And drawing cards, something this deck really, really needs to do. So, again, I don't think this is the right and power level that requires, you know, playing a full playset of it or anything, but it is good to have a couple of skull ports laying around to draw some cards every now and again. Basically, Merchant is only a two of because it's kind of the worst card in the deck, but it's not a bad card. There are just so many powerful cards in the deck that we have to make room for that I'm really only comfortable with the two of here, but don't let that make you think it's a bad card. The card does a lot of really important things some of the time, but we have to make room for better cards like Goldspan Dragon. You knew we were playing this, right? Four copies of Goldspan. Should, shouldn't even have to tell you, I just skipped past this, right? But this is the actual, like, most powerful treasure producer in the entire deck, and you really don't feel bad about like shambling gas, deadly dispute, sacrifice both those treasures on turn three to make a goldspan dragon. Because goldspan dragon is pretty much immediately gonna pay you back some of the treasure that you paid for it, right? So just a just a dumb magic card. <laughs> so you know, Goldspan Dragon is already the basis of like two or three powerful decks in 2022 standard and normal standard for that matter. And I don't think that's gonna change anytime soon. This is this deck's like probably single most powerful card all things considered and there's a reason that we want to get to it as quickly as possible but it can help us do some really amazing things even after we played it it's not the end all be all closing card it's really just a mid game card right this will do a few damage but almost never enough to put the game away by itself what it does is help us transition into the late game where we can really spend a lot of mana on stuff but in the meantime, it's also a great top deck, it's good against control, it's got the haste, it flies, the evasion's nice, makes mana for you, it's just a great, it's a great magic card. If your opponent does have the single target removal to take it down, you're still getting treasure out of it. Just all the things we've ever said about Goldspan Dragon remain true, it's, it's a great magic card. But we're actually not done with dragons here, because I ended up playing four copies of Immersturm Predator for a few reasons. First of all, there's two copies of Dragon's Fire in this deck. And Immersturm Predator really helps, like, enable Dragon's Fire in this deck. I think it would still be kind of a fine card. Mostly because we need a number of instant speedways to kill a faceless haven. That's really important. And Dragon's Fire can do that even if we don't have a dragon. But when we do have a dragon, it's kind of it's kind of nice to be able to reveal a gold span or choose a gold span we have out to nail something with fire. Or if we have an Immersturm Predator that's five or six power, then obviously Dragon's Fire is really good to draw off the top against nearly anything. So Dragon's Fire wouldn't be quite as effective if we didn't have Predator in the deck. So that's definitely one of the reasons I decided to run Predator. But I'm happy that I did regardless. And yeah, I'm playing all four copies of this, not just because of Dragon's Fire. Well, that is one of the reasons. But the real reason that I ended up on all four of this is because it's A, a great four drop, that survives Blood on the Snow pretty easily. Just sacrifice whatever your else you got laying around. And this <laughs> survives Blood on the Snow. Can usually swing over to kill whatever Planeswalker they got back with Blood on the Snow, unless that Planeswalker's Liliana. 
or Lolf, which will happen some of the time. But it's still great to have, after Blood on the Snow, a creature that survives, you know. The most played sweeper in the format at this point. Um, and survives like most single target removal. It's already difficult enough to take this down with single target removal, right? Because it mostly survives a frostbite if you have a thing to sacrifice to it. Um, it it's pretty much survives everything in the format. It also can't be hit by like vanishing a verse, can't be hit by power word kill. There's a lot of like reasons to play this card because it gets around more removal than you think it does. But it's also a big flying threat. Every time it attacks, it gets bigger, so there's inevitability there. It's great against removal, whether that's single target or sweeper removal. You know, just a, a card that is sort of overperformed time and time again. And I would not change out any of these copies. I think four is correct. But Predator's not even the most important 4-drop in the deck, but the most important 4-drop in the deck isn't usually actually a 4-drop. It's Orcus, Prince of Undeath. I know when this card first came out, a lot of people called me a Dorcas for liking it so much, but it turns out this card actually is like super stupid powerful, you know? There's a lot of ways you can play it, too. I've played it as a 4-mana 5-3 Flying Trample, like... A buttload of times. Like, you don't even have to get any real extra value out of it, but it could also just kind of be an Agadim's Awakening sometimes, which is like just silly in the late game if you're trying to come back against, you know, control or something. Or you're just trying to get back in the game, you know, bad situation. They've turned the game around um, in ag you know, versus aggro or something. This is a great way to get back on board. Or if it is an aggro deck that you're playing against and you have some life left, some treasure laying around or whatever, this is just going to kill everything on the other side of the table. <laughs> it's like also dumb, right? Well, a lot of your other creatures survive, so just, just a dumb, you are so dumb. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've spent six mana on an Orcus and just blown away everything with two toughness on the table, and that just wins the game. <laughs> So, so stinking often does that we just adjust two extra mana, but you know, by the time you've attacked with gold span a time or two, or maybe they've killed one of your gold spans left behind a treasure. You played a Skullport Merchant, maybe, you know, a Deadly Dispute or a Kalane here and there, just having two or three extra treasures laying around and maybe a gold span dragon out. And you would be amazed at the amount of mana you can pump into this thing. You can kill just about everything on the board if that's what you need to do. But there's also some other cards, I guess. There's four copies of Frostbite. We need to do that. Uh, it's just really good. This can also kill Faceless Havens sometimes. It's really important that we can kill Creature Lands at instant speed. As a matter of fact, I think it's really important that we can play at instant speed, period. You know, there's a number of cool-looking sorcery speed removals we could play in the deck, but I don't necessarily like any of them. I think playing at instant speed is important for reasons that we will see in the example game, we'll talk about that. I think sometimes it's important to have your opponent commit mana before you use your removal spell, especially in this format. They might say activate a ranger class if they don't think you have a removal spell. That wastes mana in the early and mid game. So if they activate ranger class and you frostbite their guy or something, that's better than if you'd have done that on your turn. Anyway, uh, frostbite's important. It may, like, unironically be one of the best cards in standard, in the next standard, so... Play, play all four Frostbite. It's just make maybe the most efficient removal spell in the format. Play it. But aside from that, there's also two copies of Agadim's Awakening to sort of segue into the lands. This can just be a black source, which is often what you'll use it as. Because, you know, Orcus is also kind of a version of this card. But in the late game, you can also just draw this. <laughs> Rather than drawing an Orcus, you just draw an Agadim's Awakening. And this is another thing we'll see in the example game. How powerful Awakening can be some of the time. And just like Orcus... You know how I said Orcus is a sort of a ramp, a treasure payoff, because of how much mana you can funnel into it. Awakening's the same way, you know? It's really not unheard of to get an Awakening for five. <laughs> you know, an eight mana Agadim's Awakening at the end of the day, because you've just got a couple of extra treasures laying around. In the late game, kind of a breeze to play a really expensive Awakening and get back those Goldspan Dragons or whatever. So I just don't see a reason not to play it. The opportunity cost is super low. I'm running a couple of copies of it. Now here are the lands. There's 23 of them, plus the Agadim's Awakening, so there's technically 25 in the deck. We have enough treasure in the deck that I don't feel like we have to run like 26 lands or anything like that. I think that this is just fine, and it's been just fine so far in playing the deck. We have 17 snow lands in all, just enough to make me comfortable playing one copy of Faceless Haven and the four copies of Frostbite. But on the subject of creature lands, that's a really important one. We've got one copy of Den of the Bugbear, one copy of Hive of the Eye Tyrant, and one copy of Faceless Haven. I don't want to overdo it on the creature lands here because we do have to have enough snow lands to make our snow cards pop. 
But I think creature lands are really, really important, you know. All of our creature lands are great against, again, sweepers, like Blood on the Snow and whatnot. They're great against decks that are high in single target removal, you know, especially sorcery speed single target removal. And those are things that you see a lot of nowadays. It's just really important to have these creature lands to help push damage through in the late game. They're one of the most important parts of the standard format for just about any deck, and our deck is no different. But let's look at the sideboard here, and I probably need to address the Turgid in the room because you see it. You see it. Why would I build to it? It's right there in front of your face. Let's talk about Turgid. Post-board, we have things like Check for Traps and Soul Shatter in some quantity. We're playing three of each of them to make our opponent discard things and sacrifice stuff, right? Like Soul Shatter is especially good against Goldspan Dragon and other hasty threats like Frog Hemoth, Inferno with the Star Mounts, and whatnot. So it's also great against Planeswalkers, which we're seeing a lot more of in 2022 standard at least. So Soul Shatter is just kind of a card I would play in the sideboard anyway. Same thing with Check for Traps. In 2022 standard, I wanted to make this deck rotation proof. In 2022 standard, we lose access to stuff like Duress and whatnot. And I think that Check for Traps is just better than like Elder Fang Disciple and other stuff like that, <laughs> you know, acquisitions expert. So if I'm going to play Check for Traps against Control anyway, and I'm going to play Soul Shatter against Planeswalkers and Goldspans and stuff anyway, I felt like Turgrid was a really good choice for the sideboard because we can transition into kind of a Turgrid deck against decks that we can prey on in that case. You know, against Control, we not only get Check for Traps, but we get Turgrid's a Lantern. And Lantern is a great card against most Control decks because they don't have a good answer to it. It haunts them, you know, turn after turn. Just a great card. So there's a few situations during which Turgrid can come in and these other cards like Check for Traps and Soul Shatter. Aside from that, though, Inferno with the Star Mounts also comes in against Control. You're probably looking at this card, too. It just feels really nice against the occasional deck that have counter spells uh, to just slam an Inferno with the Star Mounts and attack for 10. It feels good. The only other card I really want to talk about is Price of Loyalty here. This is a really cool card that I've actually seen in the main deck of a couple of Rakdos treasure builds, and if you're expecting a lot of creatures in your meta, I could definitely say see playing this. We can very easily sack a treasure and make their guy bigger. We can also sacrifice their dude to a deadly dispute, which is a pretty sexy play when it does end up happening. But other times, we'll just have a gold span and like one other creature out, we'll steal our opponent's gold span dragon, and then we'll swing for like a billion and just end the game with a price of loyalty. It's a disgusting card. Now here are your power rankings. A final score of 69, which is of course nice for that reason, but it's also nice because this is the highest score on the channel in quite some time. That's, I mean, no joke, because this is the best deck on the channel in a really long time. I felt like I haven't been able to cover anything quite this competitive in seasons. I mean, we play a bunch of powerful cards with our mana production and all of our, you know, hasty dudes like Goldspan Dragon. We were a relatively fast deck. In terms of synergy, we got all of our different treasure synergies, a lot going on there. Versatility, again, lots of different lines in the early and mid game with this deck and a fair number of removal pieces, you know, ways to play, lines to take and all that. There's a lot of different stuff that we can do and take on with this deck. In terms of versatility, we've got Agadim's Awakening, we've got Orcus, to either sweep the board or get stuff back from our graveyard. That leads to a pretty good resiliency stat. Offense, again, from Goldspan in the mid-game to Colleen in the early game and Magda and all that. We've got relatively decent creatures on the curve at pretty much every point, and once we do play Goldspan, we can close the game pretty quickly. So offense is high. Defense looks like our worst stat, but we've still got, you know, Frostbite, Dragon's Fire, Orcus with enough mana is a great defensive piece. Um, as far as game one goes, I think it's right there in terms of you know game one and board but you could probably say that we're doing too too many cute things in our board with the turgrid i might disagree but you might could say that and in terms of consistency you would be extremely surprised how consistent all this treasure production makes in the example game you'll see how a bad start in terms of mana can easily you know, lead to playing stuff that you really didn't think you'd ever have any chance playing just because you have a treasure or two laying around but why don't we go ahead and get to the example game, since I keep jabbering on about it. I'm excited to show you this one, because I think that it is pretty exemplary of what this deck is trying to do at pretty much every point in the game. Early, mid, and late. We're up against a Gruul Mage, who is playing sort of the typical, very powerful, slick-looking Gruul deck. That's got the Snow Theme, Blizzard Brawl, Frostbite, Essica's Chariot, all that stuff. Just a really powerful deck, but look what we're able to do 
to this deck, right? Now, we do have to take a mulligan here and put back an Orcus, but that's fine because we have two. Now, notice how bad our mana is at the beginning of this game. Two Swamps and a Faceless Haven, but because of the Shambling Gas Deadly Dispute combination, we're able to gold span Dragon on turn three with no red mana. From then on, we let our opponent commit mana and then we remove creatures at instant speed. We press the advantage by playing an Orcus to boost our board state. And then, once our opponent does start to turn things around on us, we can just Agadim's Awakening for the win for a lot of mana. Good game opponent. So again, I feel like that game perfectly encapsulates what the deck is trying to do, right? Like, do these treasure generating plays in the early game, play your creatures, play your Deadly Dispute, Kalein, Magda, whatever, just your treasure producers. In the mid game, you'll be able to play those gold span dragons ahead of schedule to put your opponent on the back foot. And from then on, even if your opponent gets ahead, you can use things like Orcus or Agadim's Awakening to get back on board and finish the job. Now that's all I've got for this one. I really hope you get a chance to play this deck out there in the wild, whether it's on Arena or in paper. I know in paper it's relatively expensive to play, but it is completely rotation proof, and this one can do some damage in the current standard and on to the next standard, so I'm pretty sure you're safe to play this one for a while. It's also a deck that I stand by. You are going to have fun playing this deck, and you're going to win some games, too. It's the most powerful deck we've profiled on the channel for a while, so I hope you're able to go out there and have some fun with it. But if you do want to check it out without having to watch me run my fat mouth for 20 minutes again, just check the first link in the description. That'll take you over to TCG Player, where you can check out any pieces that you might need. Aside from that, do the YouTube stuff. I hate to remind you again, but like, subscribe, bell for notifications if you want more awesome decks. Although now we've done all the st all the themes and mechanics from AFR, so now we get to focus on like the really wacky, like kooky stuff, and I can't wait to do that. So make sure you're with the channel for all that stuff. And again, do all this. Watch me play Magic. Hello, chicken. <laughs> that was Waverly. <laughs> Whatever that flash of light that just went by. But yeah, watch me play Magic over there. Support the channel for a dollar a month on Patreon, and if you want to, you can follow me on Twitter. If you want, it doesn't matter. But. <laughs> I guess that's it for now. Just let me know how you felt about this one, how you built yours and all that, because I feel like it's kind of not too hard in a way to slap together a bunch of treasure making cards and some stuff on the top end and just come up with a great deck. It's, re it's really not. So, But I was trying to find the optimal build here, and I think that we're very close. So let me know how you felt about it and how you do yours differently, and I will catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, Wizards. Spread love and be kind. You are my treasure, mm. you are my treasure, you are my treasure, let me treasure you, you are my treasure, ooh, you are my treasure, yeah, you are my treasure, let me treasure you, do 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 do